All right, something I have been waiting for for a while, not that long, a few weeks, but if you're as impatient and ADD as I am, a few weeks might as well be an eternity. Uh, this, if you guys remember, is my test setup here for the 7950X AMD AM5 processor, Ryzen uh, 9 processor. And I said that I will be using this processor in the build that I will be replacing at home. Because you guys know I never took the 12th gen system home because, well, I knew this was coming and this is so much better than the 12900K. It's not even funny. Yeah, the 12th gen system is over there. We put a bag on its head because it's still in solitary. It's a great system, but I mean, just might as well just go with the best now, right? Uh, anyway. If you recall, I have already used the Der Bauer, Der Lead, Der Bauer, Der Lapping tool to lap the CPU and took about two millimeters off the IHS and used it. This is going to start really looking like a uh, very Der Bauer, Der sponsored video. I'm German. I can say that, okay? <laughs> mein Mutter kommt aus Munich. I mean, München. So this is the, the lapping tool and I've already used it to take about two millimeters off the IHS. This tool will allow up to three millimeters to come off, but I didn't go that far. We've already done a whole video on that. If you haven't seen it, make sure you guys check it out. It'll pop out right here or something. Uh, and it was using the new Cryonaut Extreme um, thermal paste, which is pretty bonkers. But he came out with a new tool and he said, I'm the first one to have it. I'm the first one to try it. And he even had this to say about it. You cannot use the slider in the wrong way. So that's pretty much idiot proof. Roman, I'll be the test of that. Tired of looking at the ugly NVIDIA 40 series adapter? Then CableMod has you covered with their direct PSU replacement sleeve 12 volt high power cables. Made from 16 gauge individually sleeved wire supporting up to 600 watts, managed neatly with pre-installed cable combs and available in a variety of colors, the CableMod C-Series Pro NVIDIA certified 12 volt high power cable is a must have for any 40 series GPU owner. To see the complete list of colors and supported power supplies, follow the link in the description below. Now, since I have torn the system down, and had to rebuild it again because I thought I was done with doing this with the Tai Chi board, but I'm not. So here we are again. Uh, I've had to remount it. I've had to repaste it. You guys have seen that video. If you haven't, go and watch it because it shows some of the trials and tribulations of modifying the CPU with the AM5 socket being AM4 quote unquote compatible because of the Z axis height for the mounting options. I went through quite a bit of testing to find where I could have it mount properly. But because I have, we now have a different ambient temperature and we have different mounting, I have to test it again to get our baseline to see if the Der Bauer delitting tool, I keep calling it Der Bauer. It's technically Thermal Grizzly. That's the company which he has founded and, and it creates all of this stuff under. I just like to call it the Der, Der Bauer Der Awesome Tools. But anyway, we need to go ahead and do ourselves a solid here. I need to see what our thermals look like. If you, if you recall, spoiler, we ended up having approximately a 10C drop um, between, there we go, the stock IHS stuff, which was like 95C. Remember we were hitting 95C no matter what, and AMD was like, that's normal. And we're like, no, it doesn't need to be the new norm. And uh, we kind of proved it using their Bowers tools. Well, I need to go into the BIOS. And I need to set the fans at a static speed because we can't have fans ramping and changing uh, any sort of a variable there. Like we need a constant fan uh, speed that will allow us to kind of measure AB differences because if the fans ramp up on a curve, it, it, it can skew the results. So we need consistent uh, fan speed there. So I'm not gonna go full speed. I'm gonna try and keep this somewhat reasonable on where our duty cycle would be. So I'm gonna do, do I'm gonna, let's do 70. I also have the Celsius 360 here, just a basic Asetek AIO, and the fans are blowing across the motherboard because we do need cooling for the VRMs and stuff. This is a very high power CPU. So I just wanna point that out. I do have cooling across the motherboard and across the RAM, although the RAM won't really be touched in this particular test. If you wanna know why I'm such a Thermal Grizzly fanboy, check this out. One of the, one of the things that kind of sucks about the AMD um, IHS is those weird notches that are in it and believe it or not it's not sealed all the way around so things can get under there and into the substrate which is really weird and I'll show that when I delete it but he came out with this basically this is the CPU guard which are just these are just designed to fill in that space around the CPU so here I'll grab a CPU to show you real quick this is actually pretty cool 
this is a Ryzen 5, but they're all the same size. Um, I will be getting back to some more budget builds here very soon. These are the gaps I'm talking about, like these cutouts. So when you put thermal paste on here, it just it oozes down in there once you put the, the, the cooler on there. But this is actually adhesive on one side, and check this out. So it is upside down right now because it's designed to go sticky and down. Look at that. When it's in there and in the socket and stuff and it's, it's pushed in there nicely, it'll fill in those gaps. And you can see right here the instructions on, on how to install it. So you put the CPU in, you put that on, and then you, put the, you close the thing, and then the arm will just smoosh it down, which is pretty cool. Basic little thing that, shh, I don't know why AMD decided to have all these cutouts. I assume it's because of all those SMDs sitting there on the substrate, but still, interesting design. But I just thought I'd point that out. He sent that over um, as well, and I thought it was worth showing you guys. Flusik Metal Schutzigtum. I probably just said a bad word and Dip Bauer's like, Haha. Look, my, my German is on a need, like a necessity basis. I know how to order food, beer, beer pretzels, and women. My mom, my mom and my wife are German, it's fine. Those are the women I order. So all the settings right now are stock. Um, so it's up to 5.8 gigahertz single core. I think 5.3 is where the CPU goes all core, 7950X, oh yeah, right there. Um, so you can see PPT, stock 230 watts, uh, 160 amps TDC, 225 amps TDC, it's all stock. I just wanna point that out. And even with the stock settings, as we showed when it was brand new, um, 95C, even with an AIO is where it will go to. But anyway, so we need to start the test. I'm curious as to where it will immediately spike to. Our idle temps, as you can see right now, 32C. Pretty solid, not really moving around too much. There's 80C, 82, 83, 84, 84.4. So yeah, like I said, it was about 10C drop between the, the lapping of the CPU, actually the shaving of the IHS and then the lapping of the CPU and then adding the um, cryonaut extreme. So it's, it's most of that, believe it or not, like, like five, almost six C of that came from the thermal paste alone. So I highly recommend this stuff. Uh, I really, really do. I wish I had more of it. He sent me a few tubes and it's not a lot per tube, but I would be using this on any GPU. I put water blocks on, any CPU, anything that requires thermal paste, I would absolutely use this. Um, the KPX or the Kingpin Extreme is also really good, but this seems to outperform it. So this is good stuff right here. Now while this test is running, I'm just gonna leave it running. We'll unbox what arrives today. This is the delidding and the mounting tool. Because here's the thing, when you delid that, I, that IHS, just like I showed when we shaved it down, you start having mounting problems because the bracket that closes down on the CPU, just like an Intel CPU, only so much of the IHS sticks up above that. When you start shaving that down, you start hitting the bracket before you hit the CPU. You take the IHS off entirely, the CPU is way below the bracket. So not only do you need the tool to delit it, he did develop a mounting bracket. And you'll notice there's not really any retail packaging for any of this stuff because like, he did say that I was the first one to receive this. So here it is, anodized. It's nice red, black. Now this is pretty foolproof, he said. Um, the CPU can only go in here one way. Because of the way the SMDs are underneath, we're accounting on those gaps. Those gaps, believe it or not, are what make it possible for this type of delay tool to work. Remember, we're sliding the IHS side to side to side to side to side to side until the, the glue basically breaks and then we can take the lid off. But it can only go so far before it hits SMDs and it can only go one direction before it hits SMDs under the IHS. So Der Bauer had like seven or eight revisions of this tool to make this possible. In the most recent video, he talked about there being bearings on here, but they weren't ball bearing. These are ball bearings. I think, they look like ball bearings, but they, yeah. Jeez. I told you I'm testing his theory. Pretty much idiot proof. As you're tightening it, you're not just gonna have the, the, the screw head like turning against the metal, which gives you more resistance. The bearing will allow it to rotate without any resistance, which means the only resistance you'll feel is the IHS. Now this is the retention bracket. This replaces that hold down socket that the latch mechanism, the mechanism. It's very similar to the th how they came up with one for the 13th gen CPU from Intel. In fact, I have one of those. Remember how the uh, 12th gen CPU kind of had uneven tension on the bracket? 13th gen, very similar. He already had this one created. 
And this is what holds down an Intel 12th or 13th gen CPU to give even force. So it's just an adapted version of this to hold down the AMD CPU, since you're essentially doing the same thing by removing that mechanism there. And then you're on your own. You were 100% on your own to figure out how the hell you're gonna hold your cooler down and get even tension. Because every single water block, CPU block, the whole deal, every single one of them have different mounting mechanisms. So he's like, that's up to you. Hardware store time. <laughs> okay, I think we are pretty much equilibriumed out here. And you can see we're still chilling at 87.3. We're still at 5.25. We dropped to 5.1. So we're just about 5.2 gigahertz all core. Um, not bad. And the reason why we're able to maintain that level of, of clock, it would actually come down a little bit, not much, but at 95C, it still pretty much gave you full performance um, because of that temperature right there. So 87.5. And as soon as I stop the test, watch how fast the temp shoot down. And this will show you, this is not a cooler thing. This is a design thing of the IHS and the die itself. Look, stop. Boom, boom, boom. 55, 54, 51, 53. Well, it's still running 5.4, there we go. So anyway, I'll let this cool off for a sec under load right here, well, under idle conditions. And then we will pray that I do not destroy a $600, $700 CPU. It's had a pretty good mount. You can see even tension there in the center and stuff. But see how I'm talking about it all oozes and squishes out everywhere? That's what that little um, CPU guard that he made would really help with. I, the thing I hate about this is the fact that you go to take it out, bits, bits and pieces of that thermal paste can fall down into the socket, which is an Intel thing too. You, it's not a problem. If that were to happen, you could just spray a lot of alcohol into there. Alcohol won't hurt anything and it will definitely eat up that um, thermal paste. Just don't try and pick it out or anything. You bend a pin, you're done. The AM5, it has the same delicacy as an Intel system when it comes to its pins and such. So see that right there? Look at all those pins. Protected. So always keep the socket cover. We need to clean this guy right now. I go and I get myself some soft bristle toothbrushes. First, I'll wipe off the excess with a paper towel. We see all that excess sitting up in there. So I'm just gonna go on there and then we just start brushing our teeth. Brush our teeth. Gentle too. You, there are, see all these little SMDs and things? You wanna be very, very gentle with those. Now you might be wondering why I'm going through all the effort to clean it if I'm just taking it off. Well, again, you see how we don't have a lot of room between the IHS and these transistors or these uh, capacitors that are sitting here on the, on the substrate. So I don't want anything building up between those. I don't, I mean, it's pretty soft thermal paste, but I'm not gonna take a chance at something building up there and creating tension on those. So just by using the brush, kind of scooping outward, not pushing it down, because I don't know if you can see on camera, there is a gap. It is not sealed all the way around. It's only glued at each one of these, corn, these points that stick out. That's the only place it's glued. It's not sealed like an Intel CPU. So I could be pushing stuff down under there and you'll probably find some thermal paste under there when I get this off but I didn't want to smush it down in. So I take it and I, I kind of do this sort of an outward motion like that. So you can see there's a groove in there that matches the CPU. And I kind of wish he had maybe milled in a triangle to match the corner. The Ryzen 7000 CPU is placed in the Ryzen 7000 DLID Dimate DDM. The triangular mark on the CPU must be aligned with the corresponding mark on the DDM. There is no corresponding mark on the DDM. Okay, well, I sent him a little, a little video via email of this, so hopefully he gets that figured out. But we're gonna continue on because we know the orientation is the little arms point right there. Phil also said it's weird that there's a hole there. Phil, that's so that you can take it out. <laughs> anyway, um, yep, so we'll put that on. Tighten these guys back up on top. And then we will start the, uh, the CPU decapitation, decapitation. The manual calls it decapitated CPU. So we just thought that was funny because you know, German translation, <laughs> very dark translation. <laughs> so even with these tightened down, the, the standoff, the thickness of this, this kind of a bearing, I don't wanna call it bearing or bushing, but it allows it to still move. There's not really any turning back now. So with those bearings in there, 
Yeah, so as soon as it goes tight, I need to make sure this is loose enough to where it's not stopping it from going. Just go. Oh, that feels so wrong. It makes cracking sounds. Listen. Oh, that feels so wrong. Oh, <laughs> all the sounds it makes. <laughs> okay, so then we loosen this one back up. And then we do this side. And we just do this back and forth and back and forth and it will become really obvious when it's broken free. I want to break free. Sorry, it'll become really obvious because it won't have any more. Because right now there's still tension. I, have, I feel I have to use a little bit of force, not a lot, but a little bit of force to move the slider. But if you look down in there, I'll show you on this side, you'll see the IHS moving. So look at the, uh, the substrate pieces and look at the IHS. See it moving? So we just do that a bunch of times until it's free. So this is why the orientation is so important. Look at the clearance between the SMDs and the edge of the IHS right there. Obviously, De uh, Derbauer has built the tolerances on this to be extremely precise. Otherwise, you knock one of those off, that's it. So that's why the orientation is really important and that's why I, I need to know if there's something wrong with this unit before he starts sending these out because that would be a problem if you can put it in 90 degrees off from the way it's supposed to be because it's literally designed not to do that. So as long as only the IHS comes off, we did it right. I say we, as if Phil had anything to do with the damage of this that may happen. <laughs> but yeah, if we, uh, yeah, if it's broken, we broke it. If it worked, I did it. <laughs> it's like, isn't that how sports <laughs> fandom works? Yes. <laughs> we, oh, we won. They lost. They lost. <laughs> the not my lost. team lost, the team lost. <laughs> Whoop. See, there, look at all that thermal paste under there, like I said. And as you can see right there, it's not sealed. So when it's breaking free, look, there's hardly any glue. It's mostly the solder that's breaking free on there. So what I need to look into now is how exactly he cleans this solder off, because I don't know. As tempted as you might be to take a rag, <laughs> don't do that. The fibers can catch a capacitor and just Pop it right off, okay? Soft bristle brush, isopropyl alcohol, no force, just the weight of the brush, and just repeatedly do this until you get all your thermal paste and stuff off, okay? I'm not using any force. I'm literally letting the weight of the brush do its thing. In his video, he said the method that he uses to clean this, um, well, he just scraped it with a blade, and that is scary. Um, he did say you could put the liquid metal on here, let it sit for five minutes, um, the liquid, liquid metal will break down the, um, what is it, iridium? Indium. Indium, yeah, the indium in the tin here, and then it will wipe off. I'm just worried about getting it somewhere else. Maybe I'll try that first. I mean, I've used liquid metal before. So I'm on my second round of liquid metal, eating it up. Um, I wanna talk about this. Roman got back to me. This is actually one of the pre-production samples. It was one of the first uh, production run tests where apparently this top piece has not been changed. Like it's been changed now for the retail, but the one I have was not changed to stop the CPU from going in the wrong orientation, which uh, Roman wasn't aware of until I sent him a video of it right now on my phone. And he was like, oh, I know what happened. So um, idiot tested for sure. And, I, and this idiot found it, but that's okay. You don't have to worry about it because it's already been uh, fixed on the retail version. This is like a, it's like a rev two of what was going retail or whatever. And then the final rev, you won't be able to turn it like that. So anyway, using the liquid metal on here is working pretty well. And then cleaning it up, just using a bunch of different Q-tips to sort of soak it up. So let me finish getting this off and then we'll get it installed and we'll do some temperature testing, but. Okay, so some time has went by and some discoveries. One of the things I'm not a fan with on this motherboard is I, it's not super clear as to what voltages control what. Um, I was noticing the thermal paste, it like squished out and the temps weren't very good. So I decided to go ahead and go liquid metal. I've applied a lot of liquid metal on there. It's applied to the cooler side, it's applied to the CPU side. Um, I've unmounted it, mounted it back down, made sure it was all filled in. And I made some discoveries here. So for instance, and I was hitting 82C with liquid metal. And I was like, that's not, that can't be right. So I, I went over here to performance preset. We have a lot of different things here. PBO and TJ Maxx 85, PBO TJ Maxx 85 curb optimizer. Um, 
We have offsets. These are voltage offsets to the CPU. And I decided, you know what? I just want to see now. I'm just going to do PBO TJ Maxx 75 before I do any sort of an offset. So what we would expect right here is that it's just going to do whatever it takes to go to 75C, I think. I mean, it's the way it kind of works on there. It's just, I wish it told you what the settings were. Really all that's changing are, is the headroom for it. And the problem is, I feel like this particular motherboard with this particular CPU just errs on the side of caution of like, hey, for stability, pump voltage. And then let the, you know, turbo clock optimizer deal with the frequencies. So it doesn't go past 95C, which is not good for your overall performance because you'll lose performance by losing clock speed in, in, in place of voltage and safety of, of crash, from crashing. So if that makes no sense, don't worry. It, it's just the way AMD works and it sucks sometimes, but it's the motherboard manufacturers that are responsible for this. Anyway, so I'm, I'm set on the PBO, which is precision boost overdrive, which is a logic, an overclocking logic built into the CPU and a TJ Maxx of 75. So now what it's gonna do is try and adjust its voltage to control itself. Because what I'm noticing is my voltages are going way higher than Der Bauer's. And I was trying to figure out like, why are my, look at, look at the voltage right now, right? Under, under idle conditions, this is fine. But I was noticing when I would go to load, it would go up as high as 1.43 volts, which would explain the super high temps even with a direct dye delitted liquid uh, metaled cooler, which should not be the case. So anyway, if I go ahead and just run this test right now, I'm just curious what will happen here. Yeah, look at that, 75C. It's doing exactly what it should do. By the way, side note, the GPU, it made no difference if I was on iGPU or external. It's exactly the same temperature. I thought maybe the iGPU would be causing it to bump up a little bit. Look at that, 1.26, 1.25 volts. It doesn't have to pump the voltage. So that was a 37,738. Okay, fine. So I'm gonna go back into the ASRock BIOS and I'm going to now enable the offset of the voltage. The thing is, I would love to enable the offset myself, but I, I, I don't know which voltage is. There's tons of voltage options in this particular motherboard. And the ones that I've changed, which all talk about CPU input voltage and CPU core voltage, had no effect. I was bringing them down to like 1.275 and then going in and running the test and seeing 1.35. So I wasn't seeing any change with any of the voltages that were listed as CPU voltage. So, that's why when I started playing around with this performance optimizer, or this performance drop down with all these optimizer pre-configured settings in there, that's when things started really showing like, okay, what I've been fighting is not my mount, it's not the liquid metal, it's not the die, it's the motherboard. So look, right here, PBO and TJ Maxx 75. So now I'm gonna go PBO. So check this out, if I were to go 85C, this would probably go even higher on the core clock. But check this out. If I just do PBO, TJ Maxx, 75C, and curve optimizer of 40, I wish I could change that curve, by the way, um, that, that uh, temperature limit. I would make it honestly more like 77, 78, which I think is kind of okay if I know I'm getting more for it. But I want you to see here are the core clocks with this particular setting and the voltages. It still shows the 5.8 right? The CCX max. So that's where a single core would lock at 5.8, which would be CC01, CC05, and CC11, and CC15, or C15. But check this out. If I put it under load right now, and I'm going to go 10 minute test, it won't go past 75C. Check it out. There it is. 5.45 and 5.375. 39,805. I changed one thing in the BIOS. So default wise, and look at the voltage, by the way, 1.24 volts. We are getting 200 megahertz above the advertised all, clock, all core speed by changing one thing. Now, I think if I had not delitted this, we would probably be sitting at 5.2 with the AIO at 75. I, I think that we would have gotten our advertised speed as expected. We're getting additional frequency because of the fact that we have thermal headroom. And that also means voltage headroom because of the fact that it's, such, it's, it's being cooled so good, it doesn't need to pump a ton of voltage in it. One, 174 watts. So we dropped a ton of wattage as well because of the fact that we're not 
having to put a ton of voltage into it. And I can feel a decent amount of warmth coming out of the AIO right now. So that tells me we're getting really good heat transfer from the direct dye through the liquid metal into the cooler and into the liquid and then out of the rad. If I come over here to like heaven right now, 37 38C. Now, when I had this on all default without any of those PBO optimizers and stuff, I was actually hitting 55C with this setup because of the stock stuff. Now your, your mileage is gonna vary. Each manufacturer of motherboard has a little bit different way of doing things. And I'm a little lost in the, in the ASRock BIOS. I'm very used to ASUS, I'm very used to EVGA, I'm even used to MSI over ASRock. This is exactly the way I would use it in my system. Now, I would still not, to, I still prefer not to run liquid metal daily, but that's a whole nother thing for me to figure out with the thermal paste, what was going on there. But I bet you right now with the thermal paste, it would probably be fine. Um, but anyway, one last test before we get out of here. I'm gonna do, I did not do single core. I wanna see what our single core boost clock is. It's actually 5.65, interesting. So this is one of those diminishing return types of, of mods. And what do we mean by that? Well, what do you have to give up? What, do you, what, what it's diminished? Well, your warranty, your warranty's gone, clearly. Um, there's an elevated risk of damage to the CPU, not just while you're deleting it, but while you're handling it after the fact, while you're cleaning it, while you're removing any of the iridium that's on there. There's also the custom mounting you have to come up with to make whatever cooler you're gonna use work. Now this would not be as difficult with um, say like a EK water block or something like that. Uh, the difference is EK water blocks use their own backplate it's designed to replace the entire backplate. And one of the things that Der Bauer used in his video was he made like a small backplate that was designed to retain the socket hole down, but then he was able to use an EK backplate on back of that. So for me to do this here, I would have to chop my backplate and make it shorter and then put an EK backplate on there and then clamp that down. And that gap away would actually help in bringing the springs and the screws and stuff down to the proper height, which would actually be a whole lot easier than rummaging through my box to try and come up with screws and nuts to mount down on this and then hope that I got the tension even. So it'd be a lot easier with a standalone water block that has its own retention system that passes through the motherboard like EK has, um, which is probably something I would end up running even though I have my own JC Sense water block. Now the differences between Der Bauer's performance or temperatures and mine, we're at about what, 5C now? So if I run this one more time, he was at 72, 72C. I've been running this for a while now, so I've got some load in here. I'm at 75 with PBO or the, uh, the limit on there. So I don't know where it would cap out. His just went to 69 on its own. Remember he's running a, uh, he's running a Corsair water block. Very, the, pretty much the exact, exact same block that the JC Sense block is, only mine's branded different. Um, and a 360 AIO with like an EK pump and the whole deal. So, and it's a, it's a fatter rad. He's got more thermal capacity in that loop and a better block design than what's in here. So the heat plate on that block is doing a better job at dissipating heat than this particular is. And I think this loop is starting to become a little bit, um, through sublamination, starting to lose some of the fluid that's in it. I think sublamination is the right word, but whatever. Subpermeation, permeation. It's losing water, okay, slowly, over time. This is like five years old. Anyway, thanks for watching, guys. Um, I'm glad I didn't kill it. There was a couple of moments there where it got scary, but we're fine, it works. My table is now covered in liquid metal, and that's okay. All right guys, thanks for watching, and as always, we'll see you in the next one.